So I came from England and, and I came to live in Australia. And one of the things that when you leave your home, I mean, he went back, but he left his home, it allows you to see it so much better. And at that time in Australia, I think he was at the art school when uh, Gough Whitlam was in power. And there were, so that was a time when there were a lot of people going to university because they stopped the fees. So there'd be a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of different type of people going, ordinary working class people, migrant people, a lot, a lot more women were allowed to go because they didn't have to pay for the fees and things. So, uh, so it was probably quite an exciting time. A lot of, a lot of people rubbing up against each other that maybe wouldn't normally have met each other. And the art scene was just starting to happen here, really. A lot of galleries opening, they were building a brand new gallery here in Melbourne. A lot of people were getting in positions that were the next generation to kind of take us through to, to now almost. And um, he would have been looking at Malaysia and um, seeing it in a much clearer eyes, I think. You know, uh, just like we all do when we look back on our home. Now, the good and the bad things. Yeah. And he was very aware that his parents had worked very hard and they had given him the, the, the opportunity. And he would have done printmaking early on, I think, because that's what was in all the magazines at those times. People like Andy Warhol and Rauschenberg, all those people. So all the magazines were kind of full of prints. And uh, that flat painting, uh, hard edge painting fitted into silk screen, that was what he did. And I've got a couple of his prints from those early days and just the colors very different, you know, different from what would have been happening here. He had these wonderful greens and reds and things, lovely colours and stuff, which he brought with him. He was one of George's heroes, I think. There's a lot of etchings and pictures of uh, Celia and Ozzy and uh, the swimming pool series, plus that way of painting, that sort of flat way of painting, which, which he had sort of looked at through his prints, I think. And, I'm, you know, maybe because he came to Australia, he started to understand that kind of, you know, that you can, you know, that you can transplant things, you know, because he transplanted himself and then went, you know, went back. But Hockney again was someone who, you know, grew up in England and travelled to America and stayed there. So, they, you know, there's all sort of parallels there, isn't there? I studied at Bradford Art School where David Hockney and there was a, Australian artist called Albert Shamali, who is a Palestinian artist, um, a migrant who was a big friend of George's. And I met him in Bradford and then he said, oh, you should come back to Australia because I just finished my studies. So I travelled with him and his wife, like I say, through Malaysia and we stopped um, and stayed with George and, and we got on well. And I used to sit, you know, like you mentioned, drinking beer with him. He used to have this lovely cold beer. He always used to have the glasses in the fridge or something. He's very welcoming. And so we kind of, I warmed to George. And um, I mean, this, this sounds dumb, but when you grow up, I think he kind of made me realise that we're all basically the same, you know. But somehow... If you're white, you think black people are different, you think Chinese people are different, you think Indians are different. But in the end, we all relate to the same stuff, you know, and it's a, you know, most of the world hasn't realised that yet. And he was a very uh, gentle person, you know, he seemed to be, uh, he was able to kind of um, um, relate to a whole lot of different people, you know, which is quite a, I mean, not that he set out to do that, but he kind of had a skill. He had that kind of uh, social ease to himself, which was, which was uh, very engaging. 
he was very non-judgmental about people. He was very sort of accepting of people and um, didn't, you know, didn't see his position as, as, as putting himself in kind of judgment on them and their sort of activities and their motives, you know. I used to bring him some um, um, albums, music, and he liked the blues, you know, he liked uh, the blues and he liked, um, the, you know, the kind of Rolling Stones type blues and the old blues and, you know, kind of you know, modern guitar work. But then he gave me this uh, Chinese music, you know, so he could listen to such a range of things, you know, and uh, take it in and, you know, he, he once talked to me about Chinese painting and um, he had a Chinese painter teach, I think at some point. And he told me a story that he said that if you wanted to, to uh, draw bamboo, you should go and look at it in the morning and in the evening and in the, in the middle of the day, etc., and you know, visit it and look at it and watch it and then go back and bruh, paint it. <laughs> and it sounded, you know, such a, interesting, uh, you know, kind of universal notion of how you should do something, let alone a Chinese notion of how, how to do something, yeah. He was, he was lucky he found himself in this kind of melting pot and he was able to move around it with such ease, kind of almost like a chameleon, because he seemed to fit in every, every situation. He didn't demand, you know, he kind of didn't have a big, um, a big ego, you know, that he needed to, you know, to be noticed or anything like that. He was happy to kind of work away in these different places, I think, and, you know, get a lot out of it. But George was able to have people, different people from different kind of races and classes, and, you know, he seemed to um, you know, be able to connect with people very, very readily and very easily. He had a lot of empathy for people, I think, which isn't true of a lot of people. You know, yeah. it's one of those things that, you know, that we need more of these days, but that empathy is a very, it's a real gift. He had that. Maybe that portraiture, he was able to put that in his portraiture as well. I always felt that, he felt uh, just as much as he felt a, um, a um, debt to his family, I think he felt a debt to Malaysia as well. You know, that he'd been given this opportunity and these skills and that he should use them wisely, you know, for the benefits of everybody. So he was beyond that kind of racial thing. You know, George didn't have an obvious political agenda. You know, you know, he never struck me as um, having an agenda, you know, apart from the empathy of one human being to another. But he obviously felt this real, um, not duty, but he had this respect for his family, that he just couldn't go back to Malaysia and be an artist. He had to fulfil a certain obligation with the family and kind of... Um, a work within the family operation. No, but it's good that he had some years at least doing it full time. What would have happened if he'd had 20, 30, 40 years doing it? Yeah. No, would have left a wonderful legacy. But he, as he has, you know.